Um, it's interesting. I, I hosted a um, gambling conference in Adelaide about 18 years ago where we were considering the, the next big thing in gambling. And the whole, everyone in that conference thought, yeah, internet gambling is going to be it. We have to worry for ourselves sick about internet gambling. And today I was talking to two of the people from that conference, uh, Max and Alex Blazinski. We both, all three of us looked at each other and went, it hasn't actually happened. Internet gambling itself has not been the problem. Um, not like when the introduction of poker machines were, came into various places. There was a huge problem associated with that. And I think the problem with our conference was we couldn't predict tablets and mobile gambling because the technology just didn't exist then in 1996, 1995, whenever we did this thing. And it was actually, I think it was that which is what we needed to predict then. Because um, I think mobile gambling is probably going to be the one that does suddenly jump things up from, from a different level from the actual internet gambling. And remember, in those times, internet gambling involved sticking a cable into a wall, <laughs> and you were stuck to, <laughs> stuck to the place. Anyway, that's not my talk. Uh, part of the reason, my, my motivation for thinking about um, the impacts of gambling in rural settings and subsequently the impact of mobile gambling in rural settings is I was asked to write a chapter in a book about policing rural gambling. And I thought, oh yeah, <laughs> seems like an interesting subject. Uh, but I thought, what the hell's been written about this? So my, my reading, and a bit like Goethe this morning, there's so little written in the academic uh, literature about anything to do with rural gambling. Uh, there are, uh, as you will see from my talk, some of the prevalence surveys do identify some issues of rural gambling, but they really just do it as almost an aside, and they never really go into any great depth. But probably the exception recently has been the South Australian prevalence survey, which did really look at the regional and rural areas in more depth, so good on them. Now, we know that um, rural areas have particular health disparities, um, however, there is a very mixed picture, and this idea of the person-country factors are quite important. Yeah. So obviously, people who um, live in rural areas of sub-Saharan Africa, the issues of health disparity are quite different from people who live in rural areas of Australia, for example. So those person-country factors are quite important. But two which do come out, uh, mental health is actually not associated with rural settings. However, people in rural settings with mental health problems do far worse uh, because they don't have the health facilities to get to. Um, but what is associated with rural areas is higher cardiovascular disease, risky alcohol use, and substance misuse. It's common across a number of rural settings. Um, and as I've said, one of the problems is that it doesn't really matter a damn whether people have problem in a rural setting, quite often people can't get help for that problem, and that's what makes it an issue, not the problem itself. So gambling is no exception. Uh, I live in, um, does that anyone know where Armadale is in Australia? Armadale is in the middle of nowhere. Yeah? Um, as I've said to people before, we have Coffs Harbour, which is quite a big town, two and a half hours to the right of us, then we pretty much have Alice Springs about 16, 18 hours to the left of us, and there is not a lot in between. Um, and we live near the famous town of Burke in Australia. People might have heard of the back of Burke. That means you've gone past civilization. <laughs> and there's just not the health services available for people in those rural areas. Um, some of the aspects that have um, created rural gambling in Australia in particular, in post-colonial um, um, countries and, uh, quite often, uh, there tended to be areas of... Um, of gathering, uh, again in rural areas, the rural race meet, the rural horse racing meet was a way in which all the farming communities <coughs> could get together and actually just meet people, uh, get married and do all those kinds of things. Um, but often the race meets were also designed to create money in which to build rural communities. So for example in Armadale, the Catholic Cathedral, and Armadale's a town of 24,000 people with two cathedrals. Uh, the Catholic Cathedral was built on horse racing revenue. Yeah. Um, but more often than not, community members would often share their losses and share their wins together in community uh, gambling areas. Interesting, of course, there is a history of blood sports in rural settings, um, dog fighting, cock fighting, hair coursing, badger baiting, bear baiting. There's a whole bunch of really nasty rural sports which I think most people would 
would um, look down upon. Instead, cock fighting is still very popular, and I'll, I'll show you something later on about that. A good example of the recent Morgan, um, what's it called? The Morgan, whatever the hell it's called, report. They do a big report where you have to pay about $6,000 to get the full report, but they produce one nice pretty little picture, which shows that poker machine play in rural areas is much higher than it is in urban areas. And it's also much higher than uh, anyone over the age of 18. So rural poker machine play, the, the actual frequency of play is much higher. What you'll see later on, of course, is that frequency doesn't translate to problem necessarily. There is this argument that gambling bring, brings extra benefits to communities, and that argument is used in rural communities in particular. Um, the Indian Reserve casinos were supposed to bring great wealth to the whole rural areas, uh, and what's happened? No. You've got huge amounts of bankruptcies, you've got increased crime, you've got increased um, uh, deprivation and so on, and these casinos haven't really addressed those problems. Uh, again, some of the statistics about poker machine use, I thought I'd throw them in there with some examples. Rural South Australia has 20 machines per, hundred, per thousand town residents, and you can see how that compares to the urban counterparts in South Australia. So there's a, a greater number of machines per population for people to play on. Uh, in Canada, the overall percentage of income spent was higher in the rural areas on, what are they calling again, VLTs. Prevalence, generally speaking, prevalence is considered to be lower in rural areas for problem gambling, generally speaking. However, there are pockets of areas where that's not true. And I think here in New Zealand, it's not true. Is, am I right, anyone know the New Zealand statistics? I think some parts of rural New Zealand show higher prevalence and some show less, but the picture tends towards higher. Here you can see that in New South Wales, however, the, the problem gambling prevalence is, is actually higher in rural areas. Uh, People realize that New South Wales, I think, has 20% of the world's slot machines. Um, so it's a, that's a lot of machines to play on. Uh, Queensland, rural problem gamblers were um, quite a bit higher than the uh, urban counterparts. Uh, Tasmania showed a similar thing, and it showed that private illegal gambling was the cause of increased gambling in the rural settings. Um, and um, Urban gamblers, while they gambled more often, um, the, the, the um, rural gamblers would gamble often on certain events which were, um, which were indicative of risk, usually. Uh, and that was things like sports and track betting. And in South Australia, the recent survey in South Australia, uh, internet horse gambling was 6.5% compared to something like 1.1% in the urban counterparts. In Canada and other countries, similar issues have emerged. Um, I always love federal, federal statistics. You, can, you always get different statistics coming out of different states, and you can never quite work out whether you're matching like for like. Uh, Canada is particularly good at matching, so they, their statistics usually give you similar ideas. And they found that that some areas of Canada, uh, you had um, increased prevalence of problem gambling, and some areas you didn't. But the areas tend to be. Um, not necessarily the really rural areas, but the smaller towns. And smaller towns in Canada, like America, are things like under 50,000 people, so they're still fairly big towns. Um, Norway and Sweden, higher prevalence in rural areas? It's debatable. I hear, see a shaking head from a Swedish guy there. It is debatable. Um, and there's no other data really available from Europe. USA, again, there is some, some evidence. Interestingly, in this, the bottom of the other data, I did discover that in Brazil and China, rural migrants into urban areas had higher gambling problems. Um, some subpopulation uh, sub issues. Certainly, Aboriginal communities in Australia have a greater uh, prevalence rate in the rural settings compared to uh, urban Aboriginal populations. And here you can see in New South Wales that was found to be 20% compared to 2%. Um, in PNG, being a rural gambler was considered to demonstrate that you were a wealthier person and therefore it was a good thing to do. Um, in the USA, the tr I've mentioned the, the Indian tribes, you had a 10% bankruptcy and you had higher problem gambling amongst the Indian and the Hispanic rural communities. In Malaysia, again, you had the rural ethnic groups, but these were people usually who migrated into urban settings. It's amazing how much you can find. <laughs> uh, other risk groups, 
Younger male gamblers had greater participation in rural settings. Uh, regular younger female gamblers, though, had a greater risk of problem gambling. Um, rural male gamblers generally had a higher prevalence. Uh, social isolation for women was a predictor of um, uh, problem gambling, and that was found in several areas, but the most uh, recent one was in Scotland. Um, Scottish women were turning to their mobile phones for gamble because they were isolated, and I would have thought I would have just gone to a distillery myself and had a bit of a drink, but um, they, women apparently get their mobile phones out. Uh, there's an interesting, there's a, older gamblers, we have to think about the big bingo players and all this kind of stuff. Um, older gamblers talk about it becomes their only way of socializing, um, but it's often just private card playing and private gambling rather than uh, legal forms of gambling. So there's a bit of a debate about that. There certainly is much, much higher gambling amongst older rural Chinese people. Um, and again, it's, it's about the only things they can do, quite often their entire families have migrated into the cities. They're kind of left. There's often very young people and very old people, and it's a bit of a combination of those things. <coughs> now, rural mobile and internet gambling. There is a, a massive increase in the amount of uh, mobile gambling and internet gambling. That's, I think the Americans call 4,000 million, 4 billion, I think, if I remember rightly. Does anyone know? Yeah, I thought that was right. Uh, so the, the money, is the, the, the revenue has gone from 4 billion to 45 billion in the last 10 years. Uh, in Australia, it's 800 million already. Uh, so we're talking about M gambling or mobile gambling, and you can see that mobile handset downloads rose 43% in the last year. Uh, not necessarily on gambling, uh, but just the use of mobile technology has risen by that much. And obviously, gambling is going to become a part of that, that download. This is Australia's favorite 10 sites. It might not look like much, but you can pull plenty of money through those sites. Um, and you can see a lot of them are, um, they're pretty much horse and sports betting type of sites. This is what I found very interesting. Why may people be more interested in gambling over the internet or, or by mobile technologies? And I think this is telling us part of the story. Previously, it took two or three days to clear money. Now, with e-wallets, your money is immediate. And the interesting thing about e-wallets is that the casinos, the online casinos, don't have any of your financial information. It's held by these, subs these intermediaries, who, as you can see, are quite happy to tell you you can go to a gambling site to use your money. Uh, on the right-hand side there, that's Skrill, which is the most popular one, and uh, Nectel is another one. They're a bit like a PayPal kind of thing. Uh, but I think maybe people feel more confident that this is a legitimate site to hold money, and then when you go to the cashier on an online casino, the cashiers have, are you a net tiller or a Skrill member, you can use your money here kind of thing, and folks seem a little bit more happy to do it that way. So maybe people think there's a bit more security in their internet gambling now. And I am using internet and mobile interchangeably here. Um, I don't necessarily mean what they're doing. Plenty of um, opportunities for apps, as we know. I, I chose these ones because they actually came up when I used the word rural and gambling, online gambling. These were the apps that came up. So they had something hidden in their taglines to allow the word rural to be picked up for these, for whatever reason. And there's another one. There's a good one for a women gambler. I found this also very interesting. Two reports, one from Fortune Fever, which is a gambling site, and the other from Mobile Casino, another gambling site. You don't have to read this. The, the whole point of this is that they're talking about how can we get more mobile um, technology into rural areas to encourage more gamblers in the rural settings. So these are gambling casino sites that are, are, are actively encouraging um, the introduction of more opportunities for rural gamblers. Uh, this is one I found extremely funny. Uh, there's a Brisbane band who now get you to download their app. They come and play their concert. You play their app on the mobile phone at the concert, and they're playing the music to the game that's on the phone that you're sitting watching. Uh, now, it's only a game at this stage, but we can quite easily see how that can translate to gambling. Uh, so if you fancy doing that, go up to Brisbane, find out where this band are. If anyone wants to know, I've got the name written down somewhere. Um, but I thought that was very interesting. It's just the mixing of ideas in terms of the use of mobile technologies and so on. We all know the opportunities. One of the reasons why people thought rural gambling and mobile internet was a problem was because of access to uh, the internet itself. 
in Australia, the National Broadband Network is rolling out, so the whole of Australia is going to have access to internet. That's happening also in South Africa, in Britain, in other countries. America, it has already been rolling out. So rural areas are not now devoid of internet. Uh, but also, people can go other places to get their access. Yeah? Um, internet cafes, I put uh, McDonald's in there, because that's one of the popular <laughs> spots for people to go. Uh, but there are plenty of places where folks, including schools and colleges. Uh, Armadale, again, people come to Armadale to send their kids to school. There's a lot of big private schools there. Um, last year, one of the schools um, bust up a gambling ring in the library of the school. Um, interesting aspects of Ill illegality related to cyber cafes. In three Asian areas, people were setting up cyber cafes solely for the purpose of internet gambling, for people to come into the cafes. In, these were in rural areas and uh, gamble their money away, um, which is very interesting. So folks are recognizing that perhaps providing illegal opportunities in rural areas in terms of gambling is a better thing because it may be hard to get caught. These poor souls didn't find it hard to get caught. They got caught. But uh, I'm sure there's just as many going on that haven't been caught. Uh, there is also an issue we have to think about in terms of social control and cohesion in rural areas. For example, with kids, it may well be harder for a kid to get into a slot machine place or buy a lottery ticket and so on. However, it's not very hard for them to use their mobile phones and their internet to gamble. So that may be a reason why some might push into, into internet forms of gambling. Here's the one about the Scottish women getting into debt through their online gambling and said that they were living in rural communities and they felt very isolated and very alone. So there's a number of um, public health associated factors, suicide. Um, it doesn't take you very long to find a number of places where suicide is linked to rural gambling. Um, and these were just four of them that I found in a, in a very quick search. More illegal operations. Um, bunch of uh, people do a lot of things to try and make money off rural people. Uh, the bottom one I found very interesting is in China, as a lot of people migrate into the urban settings, make a, as much money as they can, they take all of that money back in one lump sum back to their rural areas. There are folks waiting for them to get off the bus and marching them into an internet cafe or a gambling site and saying, here, come and have a bit of fun with us before you go back to your family. And of course, people are losing all their money and never actually get the money back to their families. And that's becoming very, very common in certain areas. Mm -hmm. How am I doing for time? I'm a bit of rush. Um, rural crime related to gambling is often seen as um, personal type of crime. It's theft from other people, domestic violence, people going home and beating each other up, uh, and often fraud, people stealing from their work within rural settings. Prostitution has become a big problem. People are sending their kids out as into prostitution in order to make money for their gambling. Um, interestingly, gambling is treated as a, as a, um, a minor offense. But one study in America found that rural magistrates still give them the biggest sentence possible, even though it's a minor offense. So they often get sent to prison for a very, very minor offense. In, in urban um, courts, that's not such a, uh, such a problem. People often get let off with a, whatever they get let off with, good behavior bonds or whatever it's called. Again, you can see that the police themselves thought that gambling wasn't very important in the USA, but 25% still thought they needed to know something about it, but only 3% thought it was a problem. So there's a disparity in terms of how much people are thinking about gambling in these settings. You can now go online and watch live online cockfighting and live online dogfighting and bet on the games. This is a web shot from two days ago where there were 102 cockfights on Tuesday night that were being beamed out live. So you can do that. And I'm not going to make any comments about the relative merits of, of blood sports as a, as a form of betting. This site is a, is a legal site in the Philippines, this cockfight site. And there are a lot of migrant uh, Filipino families in different parts of the world who may well be attracted to this because it reminds them of home. It's a very common sport in the Philippines. However, in America and several other parts of the world, including Australia, for, for my uh, liking, there's been a lot of online dogfighting being promoted. The sex trade, as I've said, has been used um, in rural areas. And there's a, there's a comment from the father um, who had actually gone to the, um, started to engage in petty gambling in the village and 
He then went on to talk to the pimp to get her an advance on the daughter's money and various other things. So some interesting stuff. Uh, some general risks in rural Australia in particular. Um, the local pub and hotel is often the only source of socialization for, for rural people. It includes pretty much everything. There is now better access to the internet, greater opportunity for online gambling and so on. Um, in Tasmania, a study did find that rural kids were, had this odd cognitive distortion and felt like gambling was less of a risky activity and that online gambling was a good thing to do and it was almost a professional. You know, they had that image of it being more of a professional thing. Um, I have this complaint about Australian banks. I don't normally bag Australia. I do live in Australia and I do have an Australian passport. Um, but the Australian banks are really hypocritical. <laughs> they, at the same time, are quite aware that people are gambling and, and put steps into place to stop the gambling. For example, if you buy a credit card from an Australian bank, one of the lines in that thing you never read when you sign the thing says, if you are buying gambling chips, you will be charged extra as a cash transaction. So they know people are using their credit cards for gambling. Yeah? However, they'll actively support gambling sites. This is um, Comsec supporting Racenet, an online internet site. Uh, but they'll also claim that they will not support gambling activities through their responsible gambling camp. So they, they really are hypocritical. They're, they're mixed messages. And in community areas, the, the bankers and the banks and the big, these are, these are influential people in rural areas. So what they say and think often means something in these areas, more so than it probably does in urban areas. Um, a good example, I think I've got it on the next slide. Oh, no, that's not important. Um, the, 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 there is online help. Uh, we know there's online help, and I think there should be more online help, but this is not the, the purpose of my talk particularly. Um, I'll go back to that. The, the, the example that I had was an ex a good thing, a good cause by my local community mutual was the, one of their members had cancer and they wanted to make money for that person to help them with their cancer treatment. Great. I thought that was a fabulous idea. So they had a greyhound day. Yeah, so they took money from other people who were probably less um, wealthy and perhaps made their lives worse to help this one person's life. Now, they could have chosen many other ways of making money. They could have had many other charity runs. You know, they could have done all sorts of things. But gambling was the first thing they thought of. And that's common. Um, <laughs> The CEO of the same community mutual owns a racehorse. Yeah. Uh, the, the chief financial officer of my university is known to go outside with his mobile phone and internet gamble. Uh, he's my chief financial officer right, of, of the third poorest university in Australia, just about. So, I'm, I'm not suggesting anything. but um, So Armadale, I'm trying to use an example of, of some of the issues that might arise. There are 11 pubs and hotels in Armadale with a population of 24,000. Wollongong has a population of 250,000 and there's only 31 pubs. Yeah. Every one of those 11 pubs has at least 40, 50 machines in them. Yeah. The three clubs, one of the clubs, which is the next service leagues club, its expenditure on slot machines was 3.3 million last year. So there's a lot of money goes through gambling in these towns. And these hotels and clubs had a big campaign. New South Wales clubs are like a mafia. They had a big campaign to prevent any gambling control to occur. Um, and they all used this argument that we give back to the community. Yeah. It's always the big argument. And if we look, I've done that one. We'll, we'll ignore that one. Um, if you look at one, oh, I haven't got it on there. One of them, I might have it up there, but I can't see it. Oh, this is it, here. This is how much they gave back. Yeah. And you can see the donation room one, that's them just letting people use their rooms for free. Yeah? So it's not really a giving back to the community thing. So that was a third of their giving. This is the 3.37 million that may, they had expenditure going through the slot machine. I think they actually made something like 600,000 in actual profit. But they're only giving away a fraction of that, really, um, to, a, to an extent. I don't, I'm not picking on the ex-services club. They, they do great jobs. They, they do a lot of other good things. Uh, similarly, uh, bowling club there is a very similar problem. So my conclusion, because I realized I didn't, did I get a five minutes? Oh, I did. <laughs> I normally, normally get a five minutes long before I realize it. Uh, so my conclusion really is to think about, in particularly rural settings, we do have to think about the community protection issue. And I think we have to think about that as broader than the gambling providers. I think influential community members have to be aware of their own 
way in which they promote gambling within the communities. And that's why I pick on the banks. Uh, the, it's not just the banks. The university s um, sponsored the Parramatta Eels. Now, there was a great thing. Parramatta Eels have been bottom of the league twice since the university have sponsored them. Uh, but the sponsorship that Parramatta Eels themselves has is an online gambling sponsorship. So what message are we giving as a university? We're going to support Parramatta Eels and look, they like gambling online. So I, you know, I think we need to think more broadly about that. I do think the treatment opportunities have to be broadened and widened. One of the biggest problems in my opinion, in my background is as a, I'm a therapist. I'm my, I came from a treatment background. There's too few evidence-based practices available in communities in rural settings. So you have to rely on good faith and goodwill amongst people who are willing to try and help folks. Now, that's good to a point, but I think you, you, there needs to be more. Uh, there does need to be more research. And because I'm a researcher as well, I always say there needs to be more research. So I'm not going to say anything different. There needs to be more research. Um, and in a public health sense, even though it's a low prevalence, the consequences, in my opinion, rural areas, especially, specifically for mobile technologies, is that it's actually going to, it is going to become a genuine epidemic type problem. And I think we need to pay attention to that. And that's me, I think. Yes. <laughs> In Australia, there's often um, a number of services which are supported by um, gambling funding. So money and revenue from the gambling industry goes into supporting gambling counselling. Uh, but it's often urban-based counselling. So in the rural areas, it gets less and less and less. Uh, in Arndale, for example, they've got one generic counsellor who treats people for gambling problems in Anglicare or one of those NGOs. I can't remember which one it is. So, so the, the, it's very limited in the rural areas. And I think the same, similar problem here, but I think New Zealand's better. I think New Zealand has a better spread of the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, me coming from, uh, are you up your fingers? Was that okay? Um, uh, did you want to follow up? Really, yeah, yeah, because here in New Zealand we provide um, free services for, for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, in Australia the gambling treatment services are free. Uh, okay. Because they're paid for by a donation, a donation from the gambling industry. <laughs> so New Zealanders can get access to there as well. If they live in it, if they live there, they can. Yeah. yeah, if they're living yeah. In, yeah. Uh, and some of the online stuff. I mean, a lot of the online services really don't pay attention to where you're, you're coming in from for treatment. So New Zealand, they can go into the Australian ones and probably would still get help. Yeah. You certainly can go to gambling therapy in the UK, which is an online treatment, and you can get help there from anywhere in the world. So the, the online services, yeah, they're good to access from anywhere. Oh. And if you speak Swedish, we can help. Uh, in Sweden, in right. Sweden too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but one, one question. Uh, we see that gambling uh, the, is kind of different in Europe compared to over here. Mm -hmm. What do you see? Uh, because we have already entered uh, really the mobile era. Th what, what do you see that is something you can learn from Europe, bringing here? Or what do you think on... on uh, I your, mean, your my, my view is the biggest thing to learn is not to become... A Europe in terms of online gambling. No, because it's, it's so a huge problem. Because around here, it's not. Yeah, a huge and problem it's not. That's it's right. Kind of um, but I don't know whether we can really stop it as a problem. Um, I think the mature markets in Europe mean that it's and, and already New Jersey has just passed laws about internet gambling, and I think California or somewhere else. So play, it's like a domino, isn't it? It's just everyone's starting to do it. So I'm not sure we can get out of that now. I think we've just got to recognise what we can do to control it once, yeah, now that it's here. Yeah. 